Chapter 6, Section 2. This video covers both diffusion and osmosis. Now, in addition to being able to define diffusion and define osmosis, I want you to also be able to explain the relationships between diffusion, energy, and the laws of thermodynamics. And by the end of the video, hopefully you'll be able to explain why osmosis is important for cells. Let's begin with diffusion. You can see it on the right. As that dye enters the water, it's spreading out. So what exactly is diffusion? We can define it as the spontaneous movement of a substance from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So when that dye hits the water, it's very concentrated, and then it will spread out until it reaches equilibrium. So in effect, the dye is going down a concentration gradient. To understand what a gradient is, imagine hiking up a hill or going hiking in the mountains. As you hike up a hill, you're going up an elevation over a distance. So you might hike one mile and you might climb 1,500 feet. You're undergoing an elevational gradient. Concentration gradients are very similar to that. A concentration gradient is really similar to an elevational gradient. If you go from an area that has zero parts per thousand to another area that has 35 parts per thousand, then you're undergoing a concentration gradient because you're having a change in the concentration of a solute over a distance. So, where would we find such a situation? How about freshwater rivers? The Wakulla River here in North Florida has a salinity of less than five parts per thousand. What that means is, if I were to grab a thousand parts of that river water and count them out, I would have approximately 90, 995 parts would be water and about five parts would be salinity or our solutes. Likewise, if you go to a marine environment, the concentration there would be about 35 parts per thousand. So as rivers empty into oceans, you undergo a concentration gradient. If you have 35 parts per thousand salinity, what that means is if I grabbed a thousand parts of that ocean water, then about 965 of those would be water molecules and the other 35 would be your solutes. And stop daydreaming. I know you want to be on that tropical island right now. Concentration gradients are very important. The reason why is because they store potential energy and cells create and maintain concentration gradients to do work. So an example, if you put a ball at the top of a hill, that's at the top of an elevational gradient, that ball has potential energy. When you let it go, it goes to the bottom of the hill. Importantly, you don't have to kick a ball down the hill. It will do it on its own because it has potential energy based on its position. Concentration gradients are very similar. You don't have to stir something up to make something diffuse. Things will diffuse on their own as long as they are out of equilibrium. And importantly, don't forget, there's potential energy stored in these concentration gradients that cells can use to do work. To make sure we're on the same page with all of our definitions, a solute is something that dissolves in water. That red dye in this example would be a solute, and water would be the solvent. Sugars are a common type of solute, and we know this from every day. If you've ever had a soda, there is lots of sugars dissolved in the water. And the reason why you can dissolve sugars in water is don't forget, sugars are hydrophilic. They're capable of forming hydrogen bonds with water. If you don't know what makes a substance hydrophobic or hydrophilic or what a hydrogen bond is, you need to go and review that material. Other common solutes include the electrolytes. That's things like sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphate, magnesium, and chloride. And what's important about these electrolytes, they do not easily cross cellular membranes. And the ones I'm showing on the right, that's sodium chloride, which is basically table salt, and you can see it diffusing in water. Here's an illustration of a system out of equilibrium. There are way more solutes on the left side. 
so we have a concentration gradient. And concentration gradients also store potential energy. This system will diffuse on its own as those solutes move down their concentration gradient until it reaches equilibrium. This illustration shows two systems. The one on the left is out of equilibrium. The one on the right is in equilibrium. And it does that through diffusion. All the solutes will move on their own until an equilibrium is reached. Now equilibrium means that there's an equal concentration of solutes throughout your entire solution. At this point, the system is in equilibrium, entropy is high, and you can no longer use the energy to do work. Here's a very important point about diffusion. It doesn't require an input of energy. Diffusion happens on its own. It's like putting a ball at the top of the hill. At the top of the hill, the ball has potential energy. If you let it go, it rolls down the hill on its own. You don't have to kick it down the hill. Diffusion. If you have a concentration gradient, you have potential energy. Those solutes will move down their concentration gradient on their own without an input of energy. So if you have a solution where you've added in lots of solutes like salt or a dye or sugar, you don't have to stir it to make them all diffuse. However, stirring it will make it go faster. However, this is the important part. Diffusion does require energy to be present. Think about this. If you're moving from one area to another, if you're a solute and you're moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration, the key point is you're moving. Moving is kinetic energy. And without kinetic energy, you cannot have diffusion. So contrary to popular belief, diffusion does require energy. And without energy, there can be no diffusion. Once your system reaches equilibrium, work can no longer be done. As long as you're out of equilibrium, where you have an uneven concentration of solutes, you can use that to do work. However, once they spread out evenly, they're just moving around randomly. You haven't lost any energy. The problem is, is the entropy is now high and you don't have any energy available to do work. So that's equilibrium for you. You still have energy, just you can't do any work with it. Here's an example showing why energy is required for diffusion. On the right side is a glass of water heated up to about 200 degrees. On the left side is a glass of water cooled down to about 35 degrees. And already you can see that the dye on the right side is almost completely diffused throughout the glass. Meanwhile, on the left side, the dye is still moving around. So the warmer the environment is, the faster you're going to have diffusion because you have more energy present. Let's make the connections between diffusion, energy, and the laws of thermodynamics. Basically, a system out of equilibrium has lower entropy. So if you have a concentration gradient, if you've got more solutes on one side of a membrane than the other, you're out of equilibrium and you're storing potential energy and you can use that to do work. And in fact, this is exactly what cells do. Cells create and maintain all types of concentration gradients across their cellular membranes. They actually store energy on their membranes or across their membranes and they can use that stored energy to do work. Much like a battery stores energy that it can be used to do work. Membranes do something very similar. If a system is in equilibrium, then you have high entropy. And if you have high entropy, no work can be done. Now you still have energy in the system. All the molecules are moving around. They're just moving around randomly and you can't harness that random movement to do any meaningful work. Osmosis is a special case of diffusion for water. And here's how it works. Water diffuses just like a solute, except water can also diffuse through membranes where solutes like electrolytes cannot. Water will always move from high potential to low potential. So if you look at the illustration on your right, you can see where you have a higher concentration of solutes, that means you have lower water potential, and where you have a lower concentration of solutes, you have high water potential, and water will always move from high water potential to low water potential. So how does a solute affect water potential? Well, the more solutes you add to water, the lower the potential. Here's an example. Take some salt. 
If you start adding salt to water, you're lowering the water potential. And the reason why is because as the salt dissolves in water, the salt is highly charged. They're ions, the sodium and the chloride ions. And they attract the water molecules and prevent them from moving around. So the potential of the water molecules to move becomes lessened. And if you've ever like put a drop of water in salt, you've basically lost that water forever because the salt holds onto it very closely. Osmosis and tonicity are very important for all living things. You see, every single cell, and living thing for that matter, has to maintain some type of homeostasis. And homeostasis might include water and electrolyte balance. Even fish living in the ocean have to maintain proper water balance because a lot of fish, believe it or not, are hypotonic to the marine environment. So they're constantly having to work to maintain water inside their cells. And believe it or not, cells cannot actually pump water in. What that means is if you can't actively pump water in, then the way you maintain water balance is by controlling your tonicity or your electrolyte balance. If you're in an isotonic solution, what that means is your cell is in equilibrium with a particular solute. So iso means the same, tonicity means the amount of solutes in the water. So a cell in an uh, isotonic solution doesn't have to do any work to maintain its cell size because the net water movement in and out of the cell is the same. It's basically zero. If you put a cell in a hypertonic solution, what that means is the water potential is higher inside the cell or there are more solutes outside the cell. In this case, water flows from high potential to low potential. Therefore, the net water movement will be out of the cell and it will cause the cell to shrivel. Believe it or not, seawater is actually hypertonic to your cells. Seawater has a salinity of about 35 parts per thousand. So if you ever get thirsty and you're at the beach and you drink the seawater, it's actually going to make you more dehydrated. And in fact, sailors faced this problem, especially a few hundred years ago. They would go out and they depended on rain. And every now and then, sailing vessels would get stuck in the doldrums around the equator. And the problem is that there wasn't much wind to move them across it and they might go days without rain. And as a result, they would run out of water. And in the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, he laments, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. And the reason why they can't drink the seawater, even though there's water and they're dehydrated, that seawater is completely hypertonic to them, and drinking it would actually exacerbate the problem and make them more dehydrated. Now the exact opposite of a hypertonic solution would be a hypotonic solution. This occurs when the water potential is lower inside the cell or there are more solutes inside the cell. In this case, water will diffuse across the membrane and cause the cell to swell. Now, if there's too much water coming into the cell, the logical consequence of this is, well, it could actually burst and die. A hypertonic solution can also kill a cell if it pulls too much water out of it. Here's our health connection. You know, if you're like my mom, you know, if I say, hey, I've got a sore throat, she has a response, go gargle with salt water. When I was a kid, I was like, yeah, 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 I don't think that's going to work. Well, as an adult who understands science, guess what? Mom's good old home remedy for sore throat works. Here's the reason why. A sore throat is caused by an inflammation of those cells. And that inflammation makes them raw because it's irritating the nerves. So if you go and gargle with salt water, especially warm salt water, well, that salt water is hypertonic to your inflamed cells. So it actually pulls the water out of your cells and reduces the inflammation. As a result, your throat feels better.